It is about 9.45 in the morning of June 20, 1995. We are at the Federal Judicial Center, and uh, this is part of the oral history project that has been conducted by Professor Harold Cove for some time and uh, is now nearing completion. This has to do with the rather controversial case of Roe against Wade. That case uh, landed on my desk uh, early in my years here. I was uh, came on board in June 1970, and Roe against Wade was decided in January 1973. It um, is a case that is uh, controversial, that is constantly uh, under scrutiny. And uh, the there is a question, I suppose, whether, whether it ever will uh, cease to be under scrutiny. I felt early along that perhaps I should make some personal notes about Roe against Wade, uh, how it developed and how it came to be assigned to me to write. I uh, shall carry it in a way to my grave, but I think that I have written a lot in other areas of the law and uh, would like to be remembered for some of those areas as well as Roe against Wade. I should state that uh, I do not give this review of Roe against Wade uh, everywhere or very often. I've given it only um, at the um, seminar at Aspen annually for a number of years now, and uh, twice abroad in a seminar at the University of Aix-en-Provence in 18, 1986, and again at the Salzburg seminar in 1989. I do this with some diffidence. Uh, I do not feel that any question of ethics is involved, but in the minds of some, uh, there may be a question of propriety if one grants that there is a difference between the two. One usually does not speak um, about matters that take place or have taken place at a conference of the Supreme Court of the United States. But uh, in a way, I uh, have broken, um, I have done otherwise uh, here as uh, some justices have done otherwise uh, on other occasions. Uh, why do I do this? I do it mainly to in the hope of a, promoting a better understanding of the Supreme Court uh, process, its overtones, and its pressures. As I've gone ab about the country uh, visiting law schools and making other public appearances, I have found that there is a substantial factor of ignorance about your Supreme Court, and yet a great hunger to know what it is and, and how it operates. Well, let me turn then to Roe against Wade, um, reported at 410 U.S. 113, and the companion case of Doe against Bolton, uh, reported at one, page 179 of the same volume. Each was decided on January 22, 1973, now more than uh, 22 years ago. In a way, as some judicial decisions are measured, that's a long time. And I think it is correct to say that it's a long time in an active constitutional area that is so controversial and constantly before the public. The concept and importance of privacy was given impetus by an article published in four Harvard Law Review in 1890, a century ago. Its authors were a man named Samuel Warren and a young lawyer, uh, 
just into the Boston area from St. Louis, named Louis D. Brandeis. And that article was extant and had been noticed uh, by the academic uh, world and elsewhere. But two cases of great thrust and uh, importance were on the books when Roe and Doe uh, finally were decided by the Supreme Court. The first was Griswold against Connecticut, 381 U.S. 479, uh, decided in 1965, five years before my time. A Connecticut statute forbade the use of a contraceptive, and such use was made a crime. The executive director of a local Planned Parenthood group and its medical director, a licensed physician, were convicted for giving married persons information and medical advice as to how to prevent conception and for providing them with a contraceptive device. The defendants took the position that this violated their rights under the 14th Amendment. The Intermediate Connecticut Court of Appeals and that state's Supreme Court, however, affirmed the convictions. Your Supreme Court, and I'm use the word your advisedly because I think I'm talking to the public. Your Supreme Court reversed by a seven to two vote. The majority opinion was written by Justice William O. Douglas. And there was a concurrence by Justice Goldberg joined by Chief Justice Warren and Justice Brennan. The dissenters, and there were two of them, were Hugo L. Black and Potter Stewart. Each wrote separately. The court held that the Connecticut statute violated marital privacy, which is in the, quote, penumbras, quote, of the specific guarantees of the Bill of Rights. Appearing for the appellants was Professor T. I. Emerson, Tommy Emerson of Yale Law School whom uh, Yale graduates will know or remember. And there was an amicus brief filed in favor of reversal by no less a personage than Whitney North Seymour Sr. And there were other amicus briefs in favor of reversal, among them those filed by the Catholic Council on Civil Liberties and uh, by the American Civil Liberties Union. At this point, I read from the court's opinion in 381 U.S. I quote, the association of people is not mentioned in the Constitution nor in the Bill of Rights. The right to educate a child in a school of the parent's choice, whether public or private or parochial, is also not mentioned. <clears throat> nor is the right to study any particular subject or any foreign language Yet the First Amendment has been construed to include certain of those rights. In other words, the state may not, consistently with the spirit of the First Amendment, contract the spectrum of available knowledge. The right of freedom of speech and press includes not only the right to utter or to print, but the right to distribute, the right to receive, the right to read, and freedom of inquiry, freedom of thought, and freedom to teach. Indeed, the freedom of the entire universal university community. Without those peripheral rights, the specific rights would be less secure. Then there was a review of a number of cases, and the opinion goes on and says this. The foregoing cases suggest that specific guarantees in the Bill of Rights have penumbras formed by emanations by those guarantees that help give them life and substance. Various guarantees create zones of privacy. The right of association contained in the penumbra of the First Amendment is one as we have seen. 
the Third Amendment and its prohibition against the quartering of soldiers in any house in time of peace without the consent of the owner is another facet of that privacy. The Fourth Amendment explicitly affirms the right of the people to be secure in their persons and houses, papers and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. The Fifth Amendment in its self-incrimination clause enables the citizen to create a zone of privacy which government may not force him to surrender to his detriment. The present case, then, concerns a relationship lying within the zone of privacy created by several fundamental constitutional guarantees. We deal with a right of privacy older than the Bill of Rights, older than our political parties, older than our school system. Marriage is a coming together for better or for worse, hopefully enduring and intimate to the degree of being sacred. It is an association that promotes a way of life, not causes, a harmony and living not political faiths, a bilateral loyalty, not commercial or social projects. Yet it is an association for as noble a purpose as any involved in our prior decisions. Those words are found at pages 482 to 486 of 381 U.S. They were written by, for the court, by William O. Douglas. And I think they approach um, the standard of William O. Douglas at his best. Justice Goldberg, Goldberg's concurrence, which the Chief Justice Earl Warren and Justice Brennan joined, stated this, quote, I agree with the court that Connecticut's birth control law unconstitutionally intrudes upon the right of marital privacy. End of quote. I stress again that the Griswold case was decided in 1965, more than seven years before Roe against Wade came to the court. The second case was Eisenstadt against Baird, 405 U.S., 438, decided in 1972. It arrived at the court between the argument and the re-argument of Roe and Doe. A Massachusetts statute made it a felony to give a drug or article for the prevention of conception except a by a registered physician prescribing it for a married person or b by an active registered pharmacist furnishing it to a married person presenting a physician's prescription. Dr. Baird was convicted in state court for giving a woman a contraceptive foam after he had delivered a lecture to university students. He brought an action in federal habeas attacking his conviction. The district court dismissed his petition. The First Circuit vacated that dismissal, holding that the statute was a prohibition on contraception per se and conflicted with fundamental human rights under the Griswold case. The Supreme Court, with only seven justices participating, affirmed, ruling that dissimilar treatment for married and unmarried persons violated equal protection and that the right of privacy inheres in the individual and not in the marital relationship. The opinion in that case was by Justice Brennan and he was joined by Justices Douglas and Stewart and Marshall, a majority of the seven. Justice White, whom I joined, concurred in the result. Uh, we felt uh, that a narrower ground was available uh, because of the pendency of uh, the Equal Rights Amendment at the time. The Chief Justice, Berger, was in uh, solitary dissent, and Justices Powell and Rehnquist took no part. 
appearing for Dr. Baird was uh, then Senator Joseph D. Tidings of Maryland. And such was the Supreme Court case law situation when Roe against Wade and Doe against Bolton were decided. Both Justice Hugo L. Black and Justice John Marshall Harlan, the second Harlan, became ill in 1971 and both retired in September of that year, just before the long conference, which takes place at the end of the summer. And they then died. Justice Black a week after retirement and Justice Harlan, as I recall, on December 29, 1971. The rest of the uh, court tried to function as a seven-member court from October to the end of 1971. It was a difficult period for there were three two-week argument sessions. The Chief Justice appointed a committee to screen the cases that were ready for argument. The goal, the stated goal anyway, was to select cases for hearing that it was hoped would not be decided by a single vote. In other words, there was a desire to avoid four to three decisions, for four votes, though prevailing, would not constitute a majority of a full court of nine persons. The screening process, in my estimation, was poorly conducted by the committee. Potter Stewart was chairman. I was on the committee, and I think the third person was Justice White. There were some four to three decisions during that period. None of those, however, proved to be disastrous or embarrassing. Uh, Roe and Doe were both placed on the calendar for oral argument without waiting for the roster of the court to be filled. And the same was true, of course, uh, for Eisenstadt against Beard, uh, Baird, to which I have referred. It seems to me that this was a basic and serious error on the part of the screening committee. At argument, and indeed before then, some of us realized that uh, we had an important case on our hand, uh, hands, a, a bull by the tail, so to speak. The cases were argued in tandem on December 13, 1971. At issue was the validity of the respective Texas and Georgia statutes, which proscribed, forbade, procuring or attempting an abortion except for the purpose of saving the mother's life. There were differences in the two statutes, for the Georgia legislation was more recent and by amendment uh, much more carefully drawn. Three of the four oralists were women. Uh, I'm not critical in saying that. I'm merely pointing out the, uh, the gender uh, situation. The sole male was an assistant attorney general from Texas who is defending uh, that state's statute. Attacking the statute was Sarah Weddington, who later held a post in the Carter administration and who has gone about the country uh, speaking about her victory in Roe against Wade and, as a matter of fact, even noting it on her letterhead. Uh, defending the Georgia statute was Dorothy T. Beasley, and attacking the uh, Georgia statute was Margie Pitt Hames, now deceased. During the argument, I inquired about the Hippocratic Oath. I was disturbed uh, by the fact that it had not even been mentioned in any of the briefs or in the oral argument. And the answer to my inquiry to Miss Hames was uh, this. She said that the oath was, quote, irrelevant, quote. And my response was that I had attended uh, several medical school commencements at which the administration of some form of the Hippocratic Oath to the candidates for the degree of Doctor of Medicine was a tradition. 
I also told her that copies of the oath hang on the walls of uh, many of the examining rooms at the Mayo Clinic where I had uh, labored for a decade. One will recall, I think, that some versions of the oath include, among other things, the statement that the physician will not prescribe a pessary for a woman. Was it really irrelevant? I got nowhere with my inquiry. At the ensuing conference on the cases a few days later, the discussion by the court and voting uh, were indecisive and, and uncomfortable. Only Douglas, Brennan, and White, and perhaps Marshall, Thurgood Marshall, seemed to be positive in their positions. The former two to reverse and invalidate the statute, and White to affirm. Just as Marshall was a little equivocal. I was the junior justice, and there were only seven of us. Immediately after the conference, as he occasionally, occasionally did, Chief Justice Berger announced that under these circumstances, someone should prepare a memorandum rather than an opinion. Usually, the rest of us groaned uh, silently when he made a suggestion of that kind as a helpful memorandum for most of us. Took just as much time and effort in preparation as did a full-fledged proposed majority opinion. And it was apparent to me at the conference that uh, Justice Douglas wanted that assignment. The chief, however, gave it to me. Uh, some say, such as uh, the late Joe Raw, that he gave it, uh, made the assignment from a minority position. I assume, but do not know, that this was because, uh, or that the assignment was made uh, because of my tenure association with a prominent medical clinic. In due course, I produced a memorandum ending with a suggestion that the judgments of conviction in each case be reversed. Immediately, however, and I do mean immediately, I move that the cases be re-argued. There were several reasons why I proposed re-argument. I was not well satisfied with the draft I had prepared, and I was also concerned about the Hippocratic Oath and what to do with it in view of its uh, distinctive and uh, traditional place in the history of medicine. I was concerned because absolutely no help had been given us on that issue by any of the lawyers' briefs or in their oral arguments. Still another reason was the fact that Lewis F. Powell, Jr. and William H. Rehnquist, Jr. by that time had been nominated and confirmed so that we had a full court available. I felt that the issues were important and sensitive enough to deserve re res resolution by a court of nine rather than by a court of seven. At this time, there were intimations in the Washington press and in Woodward and Armstrong's book, The Brethren, that Potter Stewart was dissatisfied with my memorandum and that he suggested the re-argument. He did not make that suggestion. Whether he was dissatisfied with the draft, as I was, is something, of course, I really do not know. He denied it, however, to me in person and inferentially in his writing. When my motion for re-argument uh, came up at the next conference, Justice Douglas loudly complained. Um, I saw a, recently a, um, a segment on, on the tube to the effect, uh, Nina Totenberg said this, that all the other justices complained. That is not true. Only Douglas complained. He said he was very much against re-arguing the two cases. 
He never told me why he took the position, but I'm fairly certain that he thought that a tentative six to one vote to reverse in both cases might be converted in the event of delay and a full court to a four to five vote to affirm. He was afraid of how the two new justices might vote, and he felt that the chief was not fixed in his position and might change his tentative vote and uh, perhaps influence me by that change. It was an unpleasant and indeed rather an ugly conference. A subsidiary issue arose. Powell and Rehnquist had come on the court on January 7, 1972. The question that then presented itself was whether they were entitled to vote on the motion to re-argue. I shall not go into details as to this. I sh shall say only that the vote to re-argue uh, was taken and was favorable and the cases were set over for the following term. In the summer of 1972, I spent two weeks more or less in Mayo's excellent medical library in Rochester, Minnesota. That was a familiar place for me. I was content and happy to work there. Later aspersions um, in the media were cast about this with the intimation that physicians at Mayo's influenced me in the decision. The only people who knew what I was doing there, however, were the assistant librarian in charge of medical history and her assistant. Each called books for me when I wanted them. And what I desired to do was to learn what I could about the origin of the Hippocratic Oath and to review its history. I finally found a definitive answer, I concluded, in a monograph written in 1943 by a Johns Hopkins physician named Edelstein. All this is set forth in some detail in the Roe opinion, uh, 410 U.S. at 130 to 132. It is there for one to read if he is interested. It convinced me that the Hippocratic Oath was localized and parochial and became a happy tradition, but was no barrier professionally or legally to the prescription of a contraceptive. All this was done on my part without any knowledge whatsoever of how the assignment of the opinion in Roe and Doe after re-argument would be made, or indeed how Paul and Rehnquist would vote. The second argument took place um, on October 11, 1972, right at the beginning of the 1972 term. A different male assistant uh, attorney general for Texas appeared, but otherwise counsel were the same. I thought all counsel were better the second time around, but there still was no mention whatsoever of the Hippocratic Oath in any brief or an oral argument. That, of course, was a disappointment so far as I was concerned. At conference, the vote was seven to two to reverse, but it still was tentative and was so regarded by all nine of us. The Chief Justice, although very tentative in his vote, chose to make the assignment. The cases were assigned to me to write. Why me? I have never asked for a case assignment although other justices have done so on occasion. What I am now about to say is sheer speculation on my part. I never asked Chief Justice Berger what his thinking was in making that assignment. I may be totally in error, but this at least is my perceived analysis. The Chief Justice, of course, could have assigned the case to himself. I think, however, that he realized that the cases were controversial. Also, it was early in his tenure, and I think he did not want to assume the primary responsible responsibility for them 
uh, in those early years. I can understand and sympathize with this. There also seems to have been personal reasons uh, uh, due to his family situation, and I, and I think that from the start he was never very certain or secure in his vote on the issue. Douglas was next in line. He wanted the assignment. But I suspect that the chief felt that William O. Douglas, in his declining years, and we were in that period, was bored and would indulge in rather shallow and hasty writing of the type he was producing at the time. Also, and I think this is very important, Douglas was under threat of impeachment by a movement in the House of Representatives headed by the then Congressman Gerald R. Ford. Had Douglas written the opinions and had reversals come along, it probably would have enhanced the cry for his impeachment. Brennan was a possibility, but Justice Brennan was then the only Roman Catholic on the court and a very prominent and honored one. It would have been a great burden for him, but knowing him, uh, he would have assumed it willingly, like the good soldier he is. I have never had an expression from Justice Brennan as to whether he really wanted those cases. As well, you may surmise, uh, he has been severely criticized by certain segments of his church, and he repeatedly has expressed to me his concern about the abuse I have taken. Potter Stewart was next and was a possibility for the assignment. White was next, but White was an adverse vote and the majority opinions could not go to him. Marshall was next, but Marshall was the only African American on the court, and I think the chief felt that an assignment to Marshall would be almost as uncomfortable as an assignment to Brennan. I was next in line on the possibility, and in addition I had written the earlier memorandum. And lastly came Powell and Rehnquist. Rehnquist was not a possibility because his vote was the other way. Powell was a possibility. But I think the chief felt that he had just come on the court, had not heard the initial arguments, and should not be burdened with such emotional cases so early in his tenure. And thus it seemed to me to come down to a choice between Stewart and me. I had done the memo, there was the male background, and therefore I assume uh, I caught the assignment. I was not enthusiastic about it, but cases are argued and cases must be decided, and opinions usually must be written. We cannot pick and choose among comfortable options. I was able to get the new drafts out fairly promptly. I think the first circulation was on November 22, 1972. Promptly came a concurrence from Douglas, joining the opinion but writing separately. And promptly came joiners from Brennan, Marshall, and Powell, and I had a majority. Justice Stewart uh, made a suggestion and said if that suggestion were adopted, he wanted a few sentences added, uh, he would uh, join the opinion. I complied with his request and uh, promptly came his separate concurrence with a joiner. A dissent by White came along without undue delay. It was a bitter one and uh, one will recall that he accused the majority, that is me, of what he called, quote, an exercise of raw judicial power. That's at page 222 of 410 U.S. Rehnquist joined White and wrote separately. The last vote out then was that of the Chief Justice, and day after day went by and still no word from him. Finally, a separate concurrence with a joinder came in. 
It was short, being only a little over a page. To this day, I do not know for certain why he took so long. I am grateful, however, for the final sentence of his opinion. The chief said this, quote, Plainly, the court today rejects any claim that the Constitution requires abortion on demand. The end of that quote. That surely was true, and coming from him, it was an, a welcome sentence. Why the delay on the part of the Chief Justice? President Nixon was due for his second inaugural on January 20, 1973. The Chief's opinion circulated in January, and when it did, with no further writing coming along, the cases were ready to be announced. The timing was such that the next decision date, it was Monday in those days, was January 22, two days after the inauguration. It proved to be one of those rare instances when the dissent was announced separately from the bench. We do this perhaps once or twice a year to maintain what uh, Stewart used to call quote, this art form, quote. Byron White was rather emotional uh, in delivering the dissent and stressed the raw judicial power uh, business. Why was Byron White so strongly on that side of those cases? It surprised me a little, and uh, I've never asked him. I have some thoughts about it. On that very day, however, uh, that is January 22, 1973, Lyndon B. Johnson died, and news of the abortion cases was disti distinctly secondary. A few days later, however, the roof fell in. The mail to the court proved to be the greatest in its history on a specific case or pair of cases. The record, theretofore, had been held by the prayer in the school's case. I well recall officers in the court standing at their posts, sorting mail into nine separate receptacles. I suspect that to date I've received over 70,000 letters about Roe. I have read nearly all of them, much to the dismay of Lewis Powell, he feels I should not subject myself to that stress. Letters on the subject still come in. A few remarks about the mail. Much of it was organized. Not all of it, by any means, was one way. Some of the most beautiful letters I have ever received have come to me from Roman Catholic nursing nuns. There were instances of 30 or so letters from pupils in a particular parochial elementary school grade. One that I recall was from a third grade youngster who said, quote, I know all about abortion, quote, talked about it a little, and then concluded, quote, I like you anyway, quote. And there were the expected comments to the effect that uh, your mother should have aborted you, or I have been praying for your immediate death, and much of the correspondence is abusive. I suspect I've been called every possible epithetical name, author of a new Dred Scott opinion, Hitler, butcher of Dachau, Pontius Pilate, Herod, murderer, madman, and the like. I can outrun Joseph Swan, the abolitionist judge, and I suspect I can outrun Chief Justice Roger Toney. Very shortly after the decisions came down, I was scheduled for a speech in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and I there encountered my first picketing. It has continued to this day whenever there is organization by some particular individual or some active right-to-life group. I'm not picketed everywhere, but I usually am picketed when I'm in my home state of Minnesota or in Oregon, at some colleges such as Dartmouth, in Chicago, 
in Los Angeles and in northern New Jersey, usually but not always in Georgia, never in New York City, and so it goes. What we tried to do, of course, was to decide the issue on a constitutional basis, not a morality basis. The opinion reviewed the ancient attitudes of the Roman Catholic Church, the Hippocratic Oath, the common law, which had not disapproved abortion prior to quickening, the English statutory law, the laws developed in the United States until the anti-abortion statutes came on the books in the middle and latter part of the 19th century, a hundred years ago, the change in attitude of the American Medical Association, the change in attitude of the American Public Health Association, and the change in attitude of the American Bar Association. Research in those areas was rewarding and instructive. <clears throat> the reaction of the academic community was interesting. John Hart Ely, uh, who later was dean at Stanford Law School, was the first to appear in print with a critical article almost before the ink had dried on the slip opinion issued by our court. He obviously was trying to be the first in print. The academic reaction generally was adverse, but for differing reasons. Professor John Noonan of Bolt, who now is a judge on the Ninth Circuit, based his criticism, his criticism I think, largely on his religious views. Some argued pro and con about substantive due process. Others, such as the highly regarded Edward Levy of Chicago, took the position of disliking to constitutionalize the issue. Academia obviously was dis disturbed. The reaction of the religious community was varied. Standing strongly against the decision, of course, were the Roman Catholic Church, the Mormon Church, the Missouri Synod Lutherans, conservative Protestant sects, and most of the so-called born-again Christians. Of the mainline Protestants, the opinions were generally approved, but there certainly were individual exceptions. Jewish reaction was mostly favorable. The commentators of, of the media were divided. The New York Times generally approved and continues to do so in articles that appear almost annually after each Right to Life January March. Letters to the editor were divided. The conservative George Will was antagonistic and seems to be my most persistent critic on all fronts. The even more conservative James Kilpatrick, the squire of Scrabble, Virginia, and once the champion of interposition and of the drug Laetrile, which was put to rest by the Rutherford case, is always critical. My own reaction to all of this is that it was well to have the cases re-argued. The second arguments were better, and the delay entitled us, or enabled us, to get deeper into history and do the research Consul had not provided. The three women oralists each time, I think, uh, outdid the solitary male. The former Chief Justice never was fully firm in his vote and uh, would seem to have departed from it since. The old votes, White and Rehnquist, against Roe against Wade, remained solid. The old votes in favor of that result remained just as solid. Brennan, Marshall, I. Vacillating somewhat, in my view, were O'Connor, torn between her state's rights concept and a feeling of loyalty to her sex. Powell, due to his basic assumption of close family relationships. The former Chief Justice, due to family influences. And Stevens, whose position is guided, I think, uh, primarily by his loyalty to stare decisis. I also learned that in some cases, lawyers are of comparatively little help.
on certain issues. The cases have been criticized on a number of grounds. <clears throat> it has been said that Griswold and here, the court revisited and revived substantive due process, which had been somewhat discredited. <clears throat> the arguments on this appear in Stewart's separate concurrence at page 167 of 410 U.S., which it seems to me is almost flippantly written, and in Douglas's response thereto, which he relegated to a footnote at page 212. I stayed out of that substantive due process crossfire. The cases have been criticized because it is said they denied the fetus the status of a person within the meaning of the 14th Amendment. Comment to that effect is in the opinion at pages 156 to 159. I say only that uh, that comment was not in the original draft. That is the material that was inserted at the specific request of Justice Stewart. And when it was inserted, as I said before, his joinder came along immediately. In retrospect, I wish that comment had not been made. I think it was unnecessary, and much of the emotional initial opposition centered on it. The comment is legally correct, however, and the opposition would have been there anyway. Criticism has been made that the opinions overlook the right of the fetus and are concerned only with the right, rights and health of the mother. My response to that is that nearly all of the anti-abortion statutes are drawn in the same vein. The opinions have been criticized because it is claimed life begins at the instant of conception and not at some later date. It has been said that the historical analysis is faulty, but I've not seen the historical faults pointed out. The opinions have been criticized on the grounds that they violate the Hippocratic Oath. They've been criticized initially by Ely and later by another on the ground that the court should have waited and decided the homosexual aspects of privacy first. Well, in all respect, uh, cases come to the court when they come. And we seldom are able to pick and choose them in an out-of-order way. The cases have been criticized because they did not cover all aspects of abortion, such as the father's rights and the parental veto. They have been criticized because they rely too much on the integrity of the medical profession. They've been criticized as being unnecessary it is said that women are in the majority in this country and can take care of themselves through the political process. They have been criticized because it is said I was unduly influenced by physicians at the Mayo Clinic. They've been criticized because of the viability point. After all, it is claimed viability is constantly being pushed back to earlier points in pregnancy. A recent partially suppressed Doonesbury strip sarcastically took it all the way back to the two-cell stage. Justice O'Connor for a while took up this particular attack by speaking of Roe against Wade as being on a, quote, collision course with itself, quote. I think that was a clerk's suggestion. And I think the answer to her is that the remark is self-defeating and embraces an element of flippancy. She no longer repeats it, for she now recognizes that there is a point before which lung development is insufficient to sustain life. Furthermore, the Roe opinion itself recognized that the point of viability at, the, at that time was 28 weeks, quote, but may occur earlier, end of quote, page 160. Of course, after Roe and Doe were decided, there was much additional activity. State legislatures and Congress went to work to block the result. The states usually sought to do this by devices um, such as prohibiting certain methods of contraception or abortion or by denying welfare funding. 
Some also pass statutes requiring the consent of one or both parents where the pregnant woman was a minor and unmarried. And this often was so despite the fact that the parents might be divorced or separated or the father's whereabouts uh, or even his identity completely unknown. Some statutes provided that a second or even a third medical opinion uh, was to be obtained. And there also were provisions for detailed, almost excessive record keeping. Congress took up the cause by restricting federal funding in the welfare area. And this is largely spearheaded by the conservative Republican Congressman Henry Hyde of Illinois. There were many cases, actually. Among them were Harris versus Mc in June 1980, the city of Akron cases, Planned Parenthood of Missouri argued by the then Attorney General John Danforth, and Simopolis all in June 1983, and others I shall not take the time to list. I was driven to a complaining dissent in three cases in 1977 <clears throat> where I said this. The court today, by its decisions in these cases, allows the states and such municipalities as choose to do so, to accomplish indirectly what the court in Roe against Wade and Doe against Bolton, by a substantial majority and with some emphasis, I had thought, said they could not do directly. The court concedes the existence of a constitutional right, but denies the realization and enjoyment of that right on the ground that existence and realization are separate and distinct. For the individual woman concerned, indigent and financially helpless, as the court's opinions in the three cases concede her to be, the result is punitive and tragic. Implicit in the court's holdings is the condescension that she may go elsewhere for her abortion. I find that disingenuous and alarming, almost reminiscent of the old phrase, quote, let them eat cake, quote. The court's financial arguments, of course, is specious. To be sure, welfare funds are limited, and welfare must be as best meets the community's concept of its needs. But the cost of a non-therapeutic abortion is far less than the cost of maternity care and delivery, and holds no comparison whatever with the welfare costs that will burden the state for the new indigents and their support in the long, long years ahead. There is another world out there the existence of which the court, I suspect, either chooses to ignore or fears to recognize. And so the cancer of poverty will continue to grow. This is a sad day for those who regard the Constitution as a force that would serve justice to all even-handedly, and in so doing, would better the lot of the poorest among us. That's in Beale against Doe, 432 U.S., at page 462.